Father, in some sense, tags and words and labels for a movement such as evangelicalism are not nearly as important as the substance, the practice. And yet, this is the way we communicate. This is the way we identify one another. This is how we share the faith with others. So help us to think clearly about these matters in this session and this so that we might have a better grasp of the evangel itself, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So what is an evangelical? Or put it abstractly, what is evangelicalism? Or to put it more confrontationally, is the label got any usefulness? I remember having long conversations with Carl F. H. Henry before he died <clears throat> about whether or not evangelical was a useful term anymore. And he, he wavered back and forth on that. After all, in some circles, uh, evangelical has no positive buzz. In intellectual circles in uh, New York City, for example, an evangelical is essentially a Protestant jihadist, which is not exactly what I mean, you know, <laughs> quite. But you have to realize that um, these sorts of problems surface with almost any label. For example, in some circles, I'm prepared to call myself a Calvinist, but in much of the southern states, I wouldn't want to call myself a Calvinist. Not because there are a lot of Arminians, but precisely because many Southerners are convinced that a Calvinist is essentially someone who doesn't believe in evangelism. But fatalism, well, they obviously never met George Whitfield. Most of them haven't lived long enough, but that's another factor. <laughs> But George Whit Whitfield, of course, was a five-point Calvinist who was passionate about evangelism, perhaps the greatest evangelist uh, from apostolic times. So th th these labels get associated with different things, good and bad, and, and then you have to stop and pause every once in a while and, and ask yourself how you're going to go about these definitions and what's worth fighting over and what's not. I think that one of the things that we should do as we consider what an evangelical is, is recognize that there are different axes on which to ask the question of definition. Supposing you use sociological approaches or social science approaches to the definition. What is an evangelical? In that case, an evangelical is anyone who calls himself or herself an evangelical. And so in that case, that runs all the way from some Reformed Presbyterians who might also call themselves evangelicals, like Tim Keller, like quite a lot of the guys here. But it would include um, Arminians. It would include uh, Methodists. It would include snake handlers in the Appalachians. Um, it, it, it would include um, a number of people who are uh, self-defined as evangelical who have very little of the gospel left, including millions of nominals who only questionably are converted, is that a useful category, do, do, do you see? It's a long way from any meaningful use of euangelion, the gospel, in the New Testament. That's one sort of um, problem. In other words, the first problem of this approach is that it includes unusually diverse groups. Not only Baptists and Pado baptists but it depends on the country too. In Colombia, Latin America, evangelical means something like a religionist who goes door to door, including Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc., as opposed to Catholics who are Christians. And you realize that the terminology gets a bit dicey, even depending what country you're in. You will note that we called ourselves the Gospel Coalition, not the Evangelical Coalition. Although Gospel and Evangelical have the same background, 
There, there aren't two words for that in the New Testament. There's one word, euangelion. It's just that one word has come down to us um, through the Greek and the other word has come down to us through ancient Anglo-Saxon. But in, in point of fact, it's the same word. But we can call ourselves the gospel coalition and nobody in New York is upset by that because they don't have a clue what it means. Uh, whereas they think they know what, what uh, evangelical means and it's not nice. So there's a second problem. The label evangelical, if you approach it sociologically, that is you self-define, you uh, identify the group, and those who call themselves evangelicals are evangelicals. The second problem is that it excludes some true Christians, true believers, truly orthodox believers. In other words, there are some groups, some conservative uh, Lutherans, for example, some strands of reformed uh, groups who um, just never call themselves evangelicals, partly because their understanding of evangelicals is late night religious TV hosts. And that's not what they are. They're, they're serious, they're theologically engaged and so on. And if that's what evangelical means, I don't, I don't want any part of it. So they, they, there are these people who theologically are evangelical, um, but... Um, but sociologically, they're not. And so in that sense, not only does the term sometimes include incredibly diverse groups, it also excludes some Orthodox Christians who should not be excluded. Number three, problem for three. It does not address their relationship to the Bible and the gospel. It does not ask any fundamental question about the real relationship of this group with the Bible or with what the Bible teaches. So if you're a snake handler in the Appalachians, is there a probing analysis of whether these people know what euangelion, what evangel is in the New Testament, and whether they have submitted to the Lordship of Christ as he discloses himself in the New Testament, or, or not? It is this approach that has generated the essays and books that endlessly argue that evangelicalism is not so much a theological movement, and it's not so much a theological interpretation or a theological historical heritage, so much as a potpourri of different people who all have a passion for Jesus regardless of what they believe. Roughly Protestant, passionate and zealous, but beyond that you can't say much. That's why there is, in fact, among scholars who work in this area, uh, a debate that's been going on for three decades or so between Mark Knoll on the one hand and Bebbington on the other. I'll say more about them both in a moment. Mark Knoll says that you cannot define evangelicals by a single theological truth. That is, he will acknowledge that evangelicals hold some truths that others hold. He cannot create a theological profile that defines evangelical when it includes all the way from some Reformed Presbyterians to snake handlers. Um, it's, it's difficult, you, you, see, you, you see his point. Problem four, those who adopt this stance are tempted to conclude that evangelicalism doesn't have much of a doctrinal core. That is, it should be sociologically defined. It is, it is a self-justifying approach, do you see? So that's the sociological approach to definitions of evangelical. Second, there is what I might call the historical streams approach. That is, you ask where evangelicalism has come from. What is our historical theological heritage? What is our origin? This approach tries to trace the historical roots of the people who call themselves evangelical. And in that sense, there's a sociological base to it. But um, trying to track the base itself is um, disputed. Some point out that Luther used evangelical from time to time. Um, he didn't use it quite the way we do, but many people do say that evangelicalism essentially goes back to the Reformation. There's a problem with that. We'll see in a minute. Others argue that it really goes back to the 18th century and the so-called evangelical revival. Mind you, if you start speaking of a revival, it's got to be a revival of something that was there and has become dead. So you'd want to say that it was there earlier, 
wouldn't you? But many people, in fact, trace contemporary evangelicalism and worldwide evangelical missions movements and all of that back essentially to the 18th century and the Great Awakening in both North America and um, the UK. Others looking to the continent remember that Protestants, usually um, most of them Lutheran initially, call themselves evangelisch. Uh, the trouble is that evangelisch in German quickly came to mean um, Lutheran, as opposed to evangelical, which came to mean sectarian evangelicals. So a number of years ago, Helmut Thielicke's book, which in German is Evangelische Theologie, um, was translated in English as evangelical theology, whereas anybody reading the book in German would be thinking Lutheran theology. Do, do, do you see? So, so because Lutheranism in its inceptions before so much of it became very liberal and, and uh, more concerned for what they don't believe than for what they do believe, um, then, then um, uh, because they call themselves evangelisch, uh, it, it was considered a good market device to label it evangelical over here, even though in fact the, 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 term, uh, the terminology and the associations were really very different indeed. So what are the problems with this approach to defining evangelicalism? Number one, it schismatically dates the first evangelicals no earlier than the 1500s. Let me repeat that. It's very important. It schismatically dates the first evangelicals no earlier than the 1500s. In other words, one of the things that evangelicals have long insisted upon is that Evangelicalism at its best is nothing but New Testament Christianity. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But if evangelicalism at its best is nothing other than New Testament Christianity, how come you're dating the movement to the 1500s? Or worse still, the 1700s, the 18th century. Do, 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 do you see? It means that we're always on the left foot when we're talking with Catholics. They've got the mother church that goes all the way back to Peter. We only started as a schismatic bunch in the 1500s. Do, 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 do you see? I, I don't agree with that. I, I think that's profoundly, fundamentally, mis I think it's a false view of, of church history. I, I understand that, that the label came into much stronger use for a variety of reasons in, in, in the 18th century and was there in the 16th century. But in terms of substance, I want to argue that our substance goes back to uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Acts and Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, a few others. Uh, so so, so I'm, I'm nervous about this schismatic approach that, that reduces us to a sectarian status in the stream of Western ecclesiology. Moreover, the second problem is this. It cannot shape or control what evangelicalism is or should be. You, you see, if your entire approach to a subject such as this is, what are the historical roots? Then you can describe the, hor describe the horrible, horrible, historical roots for better or for worse, but that doesn't tell you by itself how we should self-correct, how we may be drifting from the path, what we need to do for the sake of evangelical renewal, or where we've got things wrong historically. At what point have historical, uh, historical evangelicals been racist or blind to some other thing that a later generation sees? Do, 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 do you see? It, it, it cannot shape or control or modify or correct um, the movement because it is so busy merely trying to describe the roots. Then, in the third place, this is a bit of a mixture of the first two. There is Bebbington's quadrilateral, it's called. Bebbington is a Scottish church historian, cultural commentator, a very shrewd man. It's a kind of historical theological approach. He says that evangelicals are those who embrace a quadrilateral of priorities, four priorities. The four are conversionism, activism, biblicism, and crucicentrism. Now, if you didn't get those, don't worry about them. I'm going to go through them now one by one, rather briefly. Part of the problem is that terms themselves are a bit flexible, but 
let's uh, take a look at it. Conversionism. Conversionism he understands as a crisis moment when one comes to faith. There are lots of people in different church disciplines, including Catholics, but not a few Presbyterians and some others, who don't think so much in terms of personal conversion as in terms of being nurtured and socialized into the faith. In the Reformed tradition, that's part of the Dutch background. It's not so much of the American Presbyterian background, but it's pretty strong in the Dutch and South African background. And there's some of it here in North America as well. In other words, from their point of view, you baptize babies, make them children of the covenant, and then you uh, so nurture them and grow them that in many, many cases, they never have a self-conscious moment of conversion. They, they grow up believing in God, they grow up in trusting in Christ, and they lisp his name from the very beginning. And those of us who have lots of interactions with, uh, with other denominations, we know that there, there are all kinds of people who have an active personal faith in Christ Jesus who cannot tell you the moment of their conversion. And for someone like myself who has Baptist roots, that can show up there in a different sort of way. My parents were church planters, Christians, uh, so my earliest memories were being brought up in a Christian home. I, I, I don't remember a lot of nights when we didn't have family prayers and so on. Um, but the result of all of that is I made a profession of faith when I was five, and I, I made a deeper profession of faith when I was eight, almost nine, and I'm not sure if I was converted or not until I was in second year university. And that is not an uncommon experience for someone brought up in, a, in an evangelical home, because we would say it's more important that you believe and trust in Christ right now than that you can pinpoint the exact moment. So the, the conversionism label is itself getting just a bit frayed, but nevertheless you understand what um, what Bemington is trying to say. Number two, activism. Evangelicals historically um, have been active in good deeds. Uh, the activism in Bebbington's treatment does not mean activism in evangelism, uh, though he includes that, um, but progressive in terms of outreach to the poor and so forth. At the time of the evangelical awakening, one forgets that uh, under the preaching of Howell Harris, 1734, George Whitfield starting in 1738, John and Charles Wesley starting in 1740, and so on. At the time, um, the, the state of the church in the UK was absolutely appalling, abysmal. On Easter Sunday, 1740, precisely six people showed up for Holy Communion at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. On Easter Sunday, there were 280 crimes on the books for which you could be hanged, including stealing a loaf of bread. The Industrial Revolution was perking along and the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer, but boy, it was vicious. Kids as young as four and five were sent down into the mines to dig coal. There were no safety devices on all the equipment in the mills and so on. Slavery was on the rise in the empire. You could be thrown into a debtor's jail and because they wouldn't feed you there, unless your friends came, you could starve to death in a debtor's jail. This was the England, the UK, that these men began to preach in. And in the Lord's mercy, after about 60 years of well-nigh low-level revival the whole time, um, the, the, the prisons had been reformed. Uh, the first trade unions had been created. In fact, the first trade unions, unionists to be transported to um, Australia as a punishment, banishment for life, uh, were in fact three Methodist ministers. And, and all of these were evangelicals, but they, they were actively involved in trying to do good in their neighborhoods. They started Sunday schools, which eventually became schools. They taught kids to read. They passed child labor laws. Um, they, 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 they pass laws um, uh, concerning um, debtors' prisons and, 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 and so on. So he says activism. Now, I know that's not how evangelicals are always viewed today, but I remember mentioning um, a particular book to a friend of mine, Jim Pluteman, who served as a missionary in Africa for about 17 years, then became head of SIM 
and then uh, taught uh, Ascend International, it used to be Sudan Interior Mission, it's a worldwide evangelical faith mission, and um, then eventually taught missions at Wheaton and then at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School where I am now. He's really retired, he still does a bit of teaching, but he spends about uh, half of his time in Africa and other places still teaching, preaching, and he's in his mid-late 70s. And, um, and he knows Africa uh, pretty well. And um, uh, he, he, he points out that, that when some of the emerging church people said, you know, the conservatives have all the faith and the liberals have all of the good works, we're the first generation to put it together and have both faith and good works. He smiled sweetly and said, you know, there's scarcely a major hospital in Africa south of the Sahel that wasn't created by evangelical ministries ministries. And even today, when they're nationally organized and paid for and so on, more than half the staff is from missionaries. He says, and nobody ever told them in 1880 or 1890 or 1910 or 1920 that they had to be emergent. <laughs> in, in other words, this is simply the way Christians are. They, they will help people. If, if, if they don't help people, you start questioning whether or not they're Christians. Christians are supposed to love their neighbor. Do you, do you see? And so there is some uh, truth to activism. But now, see where we are on this list of the quadrilateral. Um, we're not the only groups that help people. So in other words, this is not so distinctive that it marks us out as distinctively religious. And then he says, biblicism, that is, we base our faith in the Bible. But even here you have to be careful. Catholics hold to as high a view of scripture as we do. Orthodox, conservative, traditional Catholics do, at least. The thing is that they also add to it uh, tradition in that they see revelation coming in a deposit of faith, both written and in mother church, that have equal authority and are supposed to shape each other in some ways. Well, in that sense, it's different from evangelicals who have one final authority, namely scripture. But when you start speaking of biblicism, you, you, you have to be careful what you mean. It's not that everybody else denies the authority of the Bible or runs away from the Bible. Moreover, there are some groups like Jehovah's Witnesses who bow to the authority of the Bible as much as you or I do. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in an inerrant Bible. So it's more than simply the authority of the Bible that's at issue, but it's interpretation. And then what might be called uh, crucicentrism. That is, there's a cross-centeredness to uh, evangelical faith, uh, an emphasis on Jesus and his death and resurrection. There's a cruci-centeredness. Well, though, I do point out that Catholics are the ones that have crucifixes on all their walls. Uh, Bernard de Clairvaux uh, wrote, O sacred head now wounded. And evangelicals sing it all the time. You, you, you can't say that cruciocentrism is exclusively ours. So uh, I, I, I worry a little bit about the four categories. It's not bad. It's a place to start, but it's not hugely self-defining. So now I come to the approach that I would prefer to adopt. I think that there are some insights to be gained from all of these three. I don't rule them all out of hand. But it seems to me we can't have a meaningful discussion about evangelicalism unless we ask what the evangel is. Evangelicalism is that movement that preserves, proclaims, and lives out the evangel. Now that's not just ducking things, because the evangel is a word that is found in the New Testament. So what it's really doing is saying, let's go back to the word of God to find out what the euangelion is, to find out what the evangel is. And that doesn't mean everybody's gonna agree right away, but it does mean that you've got some texts to look at so that you can start with a Greek concordance and look up every single instance of euangelion, euangelizomai, and cognates, and parallel words too, for that matter, and begin to ask, what is the good news? What is the evangel? That's a fair question to ask. And then start saying, any movement that believes and promotes and lives out that evangel, that biblically mandated evangel, is evangelical. Whether they call themselves that or not. Whether they like the term or not. But they are, in the very best sense, evangelical. 
And whether they belong to this stream or that stream is secondary, although it's interesting for the sake of looking at certain groups. And, and you can begin to say, just because you call yourselves evangelical, I, I, I wanna know if there's any repentance and contrition because, because in the New Testament, the evangel requires it. I, I want to know if you're really trusting Jesus or really trusting your good works because the evangel in the New Testament makes a distinction along those lines. Do you really see submission to King Jesus whose kingdom has been inaugurated in the gospel of the kingdom? Yes or no, and if not, then where in fact is your evangelicalism? Is your evangelicalism purely nominalism? So if you find increasing numbers of so-called evangelicals who are quite happy this side of the pill to sleep around without benefit of marriage and don't feel at all under shame or guilt particularly, um, I, I want to ask, uh, where's the evangel? I mean, it's possible for a Christian, a genuine Christian, an evangelical Christian to, to, um, to, to backslide. You know, it, it's possible. But, but to raise up a whole generation of people who are living in sin and not in any sense trembling before the word of God or frightened, whose self-identity is much more in clothes and football teams and, and on the West Coast surfing and whatever. Do, 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 do you see? And, and not, not at all in terms of self-denial for Jesus' sake and delighting in it. Uh, then I want to ask where the evangelist. If the evangelist, the evangelist says, take up, take up your cross and follow me, I, 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 want to know, I want to know what cross you're carrying. That's not asking too much. It's not asking something probing. Really what it's asking is, are you converted? Which is surely a fair question to ask. Whether you can remember your moment of conversion is entirely secondary. Do, 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 do you see? So I am persuaded that we have millions of people in the Western world who, with the greatest respect and the greatest kindness and with the least judgmentalism that you can imagine. Nevertheless, millions of self-confessed evangelicals in the Western world whose lives don't show any fruit. But Jesus says, by their fruit you shall know them. What do you do with that? It means that there is a fair bit of nominalism. In fact, I would argue that one of the good things that's happening right now not for good reasons, but it's a good thing that's happening, is because it's beginning to cost a little something to be a Christian in the Western world. The percentage of nominals is declining pretty rapidly. That's why the mainline churches are dropping pretty close to 10% a year. And, and, and if, if you don't have a powerful gospel that you're willing to die for, why shouldn't it drop? And in my judgment, that simply means that it's becoming a little clearer who's a Christian and who's not. That's not bad. Have some of you seen Rod Dreher's book, The Benedict Option? How many of you have heard of or read or? Oh, quite a few of you. For those of you who haven't, let me say something about The Benedict Option. Um, he's really saying that the culture has gone so far away from the Judeo-Christian heritage that was part of our past. He's not pretending that our past was all Christian, evangelical, but the Judeo-Christian heritage that was part of our past. That, that Christian churches have got to think of themselves as a separate community with different cultural rules, different ways in which they organize um, dates or getting married or what they watch on TV or how they handle the digital world or their sense of humor, what films they would see or not see. Uh, they, they, they've, got, they've got to see themselves as a counterculture. Benedict, of course, from the chap who uh, started a whole new order. But of course, his was a monkish order. And Dreher himself is not saying we've got to all become monks. Although there are some medieval specialists who are saying what, what we really need is a new generation of monasteries for people who are serious about Christianity. Oh, that's a load of rubbish. Try, 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 try to find a monastery in the New Testament. I mean, can you imagine the Apostle Paul saying, you know, the world under Nero is a pretty rotten place. I think I'm going to sit on the top of a tower and call myself Simon Stylites. I, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Um, so, so, so that's not what Dreher himself seems to mean. Dreher seems to me be, be, be saying something like, we need, we need Christians who live 
counterculturally. That is, they, they not only believe certain truths, but they, they organize their churches so that there is a, a challenge to the culture and the way they live and their sense of humor and what they watch and all the rest. And I would say that in some measure, evangelicals have always done that at their best. That's why um, John Stott, 50 years ago, when he wrote a popular commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, called it Christian counterculture. We, we've always been aware of that. It, there's nothing new. It's just that as the culture moves farther and farther away from the Judeo-Christian heritage, the markers become stronger. They, they, they become sharper. And we're going to have to become more self-consciously confrontational uh, to think about these kinds of things or else we'll get swept along by the tide. I don't think that it warrants um, uh, withdrawal completely. If it warrants withdrawal completely, then pretty soon you have a purely defensive posture and you're not, you're not trying to evangelize anymore. You have no contact with the broader world. That's wrong too. When Paul is, is confronting the world constantly with the gospel, when he's arguing with the philosophers in Athens and he's confronting the um, debauched society of Corinth and so on, um, that, that's, that's not an apostolic model to withdraw in that sense. But to live differently, that's apostolic. That is mandated by Holy Scripture. And if that has uh, been brought to focus by Dreher, I'm very grateful. So another way of getting at this is um, through something that has been mentioned by a couple of our speakers. Historically, evangelicalism has defined itself by the formal principle and the material principle and over against two traditional perceived enemies. The formal principle, of course, is the authority of Holy Scripture alone, sola scriptura. The material principle is the substance of what the Scriptures actually say. That is our understanding of what the Gospel really is. That brings us back to doing our studies on the content of the Gospel. I'll say more about that in just a couple of minutes. So the formal principle and the material principle. And historically that has worked out, as I told you that I'm not rejecting the historical discussions uh, completely. Uh, historically that has worked out. At the time of the Reformation, Protestantism, evangelical Protestantism, Protestantism largely defined itself over against late medieval Catholicism. So the points of dispute turned on the sweep of authority. Did it lie in tradition or did it lie in scripture? It, it, it turned on mediation. Do we need Mary and the saints or is Jesus alone our mediator? It turned on the nature of Holy Communion. Is this also a sacrifice with the same sacrificial value as the sacrifice of Christ on the cross in some mysterious way? Um, uh, it, it turned on uh, uh, whether there's a purgatory to escape by the paying of money for masses and so on. Um, it, it turned on practical things like is there a place for indulgences whatsoever and therefore also on the question of who has the authority to forgive sin. It turns on where authority lies in the nature of interpretation and, and on and on and on and on and on. And at all of these points and in many more, the, the nature of Christian assurance and the nature of saving faith and so on, um, uh, the, the lines were drawn pretty sharply so that the self-perceived evangelical Protestant opponent was medieval Catholicism. But as the uh, Enlightenment hit, the Enlightenment initially was led by people who were mostly Christians or, or deists. But as the Enlightenment progressed, it, it included more and more people who were skeptics of one sort or another until by the 19th century, uh, there were an awful lot of people who had little place for um, the miraculous, the supernatural, and, and, and so on. Um, and, and so suddenly, um, uh, Christians, in the evangelical tradition who were standing over against Catholicism on all kinds of fronts, we're now facing in this direction and confronting what is nowadays called flat out liberalism on all kinds of fronts. And in some respects, this flat out liberalism that was being confronted was also being confronted by conservative Catholics too. So that in some disputes, um, evangelicals and Catholics stood side by side. At least both groups are Trinitarian. At least both insist that Jesus rose from the dead. In some sense, his death was to take away our sins and, and, and so on. Do you, do, do you see? Over against people who said, well, the resurrection is, is a glorious myth about our rising to new hope and, and so on, but it has nothing to do with historical uh, substance and so forth. And, and historically, evangelicalism has confronted 
the first the one, first the other. Now you could argue today that it's confronting uh, other things to do, like postmodern epistemology and so on. Uh, that true is a Western phenomenon. It's not true in most of the rest of the world. So um, let me say something a little more biblical now about the material principle. Turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There are lots of places we could turn to to get a, a, a working definition of the gospel. But let me say at least a few things about uh, what this passage says. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. So that's what he's going to be doing in the following verses. You want to know what the gospel is? See Paul's own summary of it. The gospel which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. And in Pauline terminology that means saved from the wrath to come, saved from hell, saved from judgment. This gospel is good news about what God has done to save people from hell, from judgment, from condemnation. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. So the way they got this gospel is by the preaching of the revelation. And if you don't hold on firmly, you believed in vain. That is, by definition, gospel faith perseveres. Now there are a lot of texts that justify that point. I won't try to, um, to, to justify it here. I'll just quote a couple of texts that you can look up at your leisure. One is Hebrews 3.14. We have been made partakers of Christ if we hold our beginning confidence steadfast to the end. Or again, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, certain people went out from us, that is, they were baptized members in good standing in the church, they went out from us in order that it might be made clear that they never were of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that they were not of us. In, in, in other words, uh, real Christianity, by definition, sticks. It, 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 it perseveres. So sometimes when we argue about the perseverance of the saints and this, this sort of thing, the nature of apostasy, we're starting the wrong way around. Um, uh, we're starting around by asking, uh, can Christians fall away? In the passages I've just quoted, uh, you start at the other end and say, by definition, Christians are the ones who do stick. So, that, that's, that's the genius of Hebrews 3.14, that's the genius of 1 John 2, and it's what's presupposed here. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. So, what does he say? What I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Christ died for our sins. So this gospel is Christological. It's about Christ, who he is, and what he's done. It's also profoundly theological. That is to say, it's not just Christ as a cipher or a figure, but his cross work by which our sins were removed. That's a theological concept. It's a God-centered concept. Sin in the scripture is presupposed to be defined in reference to God. You remember David after he's committed the horrible sins with Bathsheba and the murder of Bathsheba's husband and so on. He eventually is brought to repentance and he writes Psalm 51. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. At one level you want to say that's a lot of rubbish. Because after all, he certainly seemed to have sinned against Bathsheba. He seduced her. Against you only, he's saying to God. He sinned against uh, Uriah the Hittite. He had him bumped off. Sinned against the military high command. He corrupted them. Sinned against the whole of his people because uh, he's the chief magistrate. He's supposed to be upholding justice and he's betrayed the whole lot. He's sinned against his family. It's hard to think of anybody that he didn't sin against. And he sits there and writes, against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And yet in a profound sense, that's exactly right, just the same, because what makes sin sin is that it's an offense against God. That's what makes sin so heinous. So he knows that he's guilty with respect to Bathsheba. He knows that he's guilty with respect to Uriah. He knows that he's guilty with respect to the military high command. But what makes sin is that it's defiance of God. If you cheat on your income tax on April 15 this year, the offended party, the most offended party is God Almighty not Uncle Sam. 
So with the assumption, you see, that sin is first and foremost defined as offense against God, to say that Christ died for our sins is making not only a Christological comment, it's making a theological comment. By this death, our sins have been removed. So it's Christological, it's uh, theological. Now let me pause there before we go through some more ickles, theological and Christological, but we'll, we'll pause there. Do, do, do you see, when you ask people in your church or in your family, what is the gospel, what will they say to you? Well, they might say a lot of things. They might say something like, it's uh, receiving Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal savior. Is that the gospel? It's not, not even close. For, for a start, the expression, receiving Jesus into your heart as your personal savior is not a biblical expression. I mean, I don't mind using it. I, I think I know what people mean by it. But if you're going to define your theology biblically, we should start with biblical categories at least. It's helpful, you know. And, and second, th th that is telling you what you do. Now, you need to do it. But when it's telling you what you do, it's not focusing on what God has done in Christ Jesus. It's not good news particularly. It's merely duty. Do, do, do you see? Why should you do this? The point is that euangelion is first and foremost angelion. Before it's you, it's angelion. That is to say, it's, it's news, it's, it's announcement. It's, it's announcement of something. It's announcement of great news that's very impressive, but, but it's news. What is the nature of this news? And the nature of this news is God has done something in Christ to save his image bearers from their sin. Now you can figure this out in much more detail. He has sent him to the cross on our behalf to bear our sins in his own body on the tree. So that we might rise from the dead, not only reconciled to God, but one day with resurrection existence in a new heaven and a new earth. You can put things together more and more and more. I have a friend, you know, he's a council member of the coalition, Mark Dever, when he takes on six new guys in what he calls his ecclesiological boot camp. One of the first assignments he gives them is, define the gospel in one sentence. Oh, he says, in fact, define the gospel in one word. Then define the gospel in one sentence. Then define the gospel in one paragraph. Define the gospel in one page. Define the gospel in 10 pages. Now, mercifully, he doesn't go beyond that. <laughs> Book comes next, encyclopedias after that. You know? And I'm sure in one sense you could do it. But, you know, define the gospel in one word, it might come out, Jesus. Well, it's not wrong, but it's not particularly clarifying. I mean, Mormons could say the same thing, and Jehovah's Witnesses could say the same thing, and Catholics could say the same thing, and even some Unitarians could say the same. But it, it, it's, it's not very clarifying. So, Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's a lot better. Uh, you want to have some understanding of what sins is and what does died for mean? As our representative or our substitute or our moral example? So yeah, yeah, there's, there's more that you want to say, but it, it's, it's more than just Jesus. And so then shall you add a full sentence? Christ died, oh, back off. God sent Christ to redeem us. Christ who died on the cross to bear away our sin cancel the guilt and propitiate the righteous wrath of the triune God in order that we might be reconciled to him by the death and resurrection of his son, transformed by the spirit whom he bequeaths in consequence of his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, I'm getting a little closer. <laughs> and, and you realize that I still haven't said anything about the body of Christ, the church. I haven't said anything about election. I haven't said anything about the nature of saving faith. I haven't, there's a lot of things I haven't said yet. Do you, 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 you see? Now, we're getting close to something important that I'll be at in a minute. Just, just for, for, for a moment, let me just run through a couple more things in 1 Corinthians 15. So, the gospel is Christological. It's theological. It's biblical. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
And the phrase is repeated two or three times. It's, it's, it's biblical. Uh, I wish I could tease that out at greater length. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. It's historical. That is, it happened at a certain set time in history. So historical is it that a little farther on, he says, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead when in fact historically he did not rise from the dead, your faith is in vain. So this historicality to the resurrection, to the good news, is part of what helps to define faith. Faith is not believing something that may or may not have been true. Faith in this passage, it can vary a bit from passage to passage. It has different nuances in different parts of the Bible. But faith here is the God-given ability to recognize and trust what God has truly done and truly said. So if you believe with all your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, when in reality he hasn't risen from the dead, a little farther on in the chapter, Paul goes on to say, your faith is useless. It's not worth a scrap. But the Bible never encourages you to believe something that isn't true. It, it doesn't even believe you to, encourage you to believe something that might not be true. The Bible does not say, shut up and don't ask any more questions. Just, just believe, you know? Don't ask stupid questions. That's for intellectuals and other reprobates. Meanwhile, you get on and just believe, believe, believe. That's not the way the Bible works. Indeed, the way faith is strengthened in the scripture is by the able articulation of truth, not least witnessed truth. So it's biblical, it's historical. That he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500. It's witnessed truth in the historical arena. That's the importance of witnesses in the book of Acts. Do you see? It's not a temporal truth. It's witnessed truth, historical truth in the arena. And then as you go on further in the chapter, we could say that it's also that which transforms human beings because this is the culmination of 14 chapters where Paul has insisted again and again and again that unless your life is transformed by the gospel, there's a big question mark over your life as to whether you've got the gospel at all. So in this same book, after all, just a few chapters back, we read things like this. Um, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. What's presupposed is there will be repentance and faith. It's, it's not denying there's a possibility of backsliding and slipping, and, but, but in terms of a stance, a way you live, and so on, this gospel is powerful to change people. Could you see? That which you once hated, you come to love. That which you once loved, at very least, you become very suspicious of it. Now, let me say one more thing. I've gone by my 45 minutes. I'm going to say another couple of minutes, and there'll be about 10 minutes for questions, and there'll be one or two people roving around with microphones. And so if you want to say something, wave your hand in the air, and miraculously... A microphone will drop down in front of your nose and your words will be preserved for posterity. <laughs> the additional thing I'd like to say is this. One of the reasons why I began a moment ago with my example from my friend Mark Dever with uh, brief ways, longer ways and so on to define what the gospel is, is to introduce you to the notion of the center-bounded set Mathematicians will distinguish between the center bounded set and the boundary bounded set. In a boundary bounded set, you establish what the boundary is and everything inside the boundary is in the set. Everything outside the boundary is outside the set. So who is a Christian? Well, in a boundary bounded set, you define the boundary as precisely as you can and then if you find that somebody doesn't quite fit the criteria, then he or she must be outside the set, not a Christian. And to be charitable, you want to stretch those definitions as far out as you can to include as many people in the Christian orb as possible. Do you, do you know? Which practically means lowering the standards as much as possible so you can get them in, sort of thing. That is, in my view, a huge mistake. Partly because we don't know enough about people's hearts. Moreover, there, there are all kinds of fuzzy realities that we have to face in this regard. 
So is, is this person a brand new baby Christian who is denying certain things because they have not yet got enough instruction, but they are heading in the right direction? Or is this person a long-standing Christian who hasn't had much training? Or is this person a long-term teacher in the church who is teaching and promoting something genuinely heretical? So it's not just a doctrinal issue. It's where they are in terms of status in their life and whether they're trying to promote it at some point in their life. Do you, do, do, do you see? I've seen many people come to faith in Christ Jesus whose lives were a social wreck to begin with. And sometimes it took weeks, months, even longer before this area of their life and then another area of their life and then another area of their life was, was cleaned up. And during that period, you might question at first, is there enough fruit there to believe that there, re there really is conversion? But you, you want to be very careful not simply to commit them to the lowest level of Dante's Inferno because um, they're, they're doing something naughty. You know, I, I want to see where they're going to be in six months. I want to see the trajectory of their life. Do you see? And then, historically, fourth century Orthodox Christianity insisted that you believe in the eternal generation of the Son. I venture to guess there's a substantial number of people in this room who don't know what the eternal generation of the Son is and couldn't say whether they believe it or not. Does that mean, therefore, that you're not Orthodox? Not necessarily. It might just mean that on this particular issue, you're, am I allowed to say this, a wee bit ignorant? It's not the issue that is being primarily challenged today. At least it wasn't until about two and a half years ago. Uh, and now it is again. But, but that's... Sometimes the issue is not just what you believe, but whether you believe the thing that is being challenged at a particular moment. You, you, you see, I have long argued that the issue of the indulgences at the time of the Reformation was not the right issue over which to split the church. It was stupid, it was sinful, it was corrupt, it was larcenous. But you split the whole Western church over indulgences for crying out loud? But it became the trigger issue, which raised questions about justification, the truth of the Bible, the nature of regeneration, the authority of the Pope, and on and on and on. It became a trigger, you see, which test. So that, that, that helped to define what side you were on. Now, in our day, in our, in our generation, at least in this part of the world, indulgences is not a big deal. It's a big deal in some parts of Latin America. And both this current pope and the previous pope, Benedict, not the same Benedict, um, uh, went to great lengths to justify um, the maintenance of indulgences and was offering full indulgences for giving certain amounts of gifts and so on and so on. It, it, in that regard, Rome hasn't changed all that much. And I, I, I would argue that because that is such a marker that if you come down on the wrong side of that one, you, you, you really haven't got hold of the gospel very much at all. But today, the issue is by and large a little different. Today, one of the markers is homosexual marriage. And again, I'd want to say it's the wrong area on which to split the church. We have entire denominations who deny the deity of Christ, deny the resurrection. Nobody does anything. So we split it over homosexual marriage. But in the providence of God, it's becoming the trigger issue. It's a trigger issue in our culture that is asking the fundamental question, do you live under the authority of Holy Scripture or not? And thus it becomes everything. So with a center-bounded set, what you try to do is create a central set of definitions of what the gospel is that's pretty robust, that's pretty detailed, that's biblically and exegetically faithful, it's strong. But at the same time, the only people who you really know are going to subscribe fully are those who are well-trained, well-thought-through, well-read, pastors with some experience, and so on, so on, so on. And you don't try to decide all the time who's in and out. Now, in the context of discipline in the local church, there is some in and out deciding that you have to do. Yeah, I understand that. But in terms of global Christianity, um, you're more concerned to get the definition of what a true Christian does believe, not in the lowest common denominator language, not, not how much can you disbelieve and still get away with it. What can I disbelieve and still get into heaven and escape hell? Not that, but... What is the gospel and how much of it can I bring myself to believe and trust Christ for 
implicitly and explicitly because he's so glorious. Uh, what does the Bible teach about these things, you see? You define these things at the center, and then as people move farther and farther away, you eventually get to trigger bits, like Galatians chapter one that we've been looking at, and other bits, which actually put somebody unreservedly outside the camp. I think that we need to spend a lot of time in our thinking, in our churches, in our small groups and so on, not to saying, how little can I get away with believing and still be a Christian? But what should Christians believe in the light of God's most holy word? So an evangelical at his best, I would argue, is a person who believes the good news found in the New Testament, defined by the New Testament, that God has sent his son to die on the cross and rise from the dead, ascend to glory, seated at the right hand of God, coming at the end of the age to redeem his image bearers from their sin, their condemnation, pouring upon them his spirit to justify them, sanctify them, and one day glorify them in perfection. It's all the good news of what God has done. And this demands a response of obedience, repentance, faith. That's one long sentence. Now we've got about uh, huh, four or five minutes, that's all. Some people rabbit on and on and on, you know. But we have four or five minutes for, for questions. If you want to raise a question before uh, we end, then please raise the hand. I see that hand. I see two hands. I just had a quick practical question. You mentioned creating a Christian counterculture, and it made me think of Hebrews, <clears throat> Hebrews 3, just from a practical perspective, where the author of Hebrews, the little picture that he gives of, of the church is this picture of <clears throat> people encouraging one another. And my question is, what, what is he talking about there very practically as we sort of create this counterculture? How do we encourage one another to not succumb to the pressures and temptations of the world, just practically? Don't forget that in the context of Hebrews chapter 3, especially from verse 7 on, where he quotes Psalm 95 and so on, he's talking about the danger of, um, of, of uh, imitating those who fell away in the wilderness. They escaped uh, Egypt and then they uh, fell away like flies because of their unbelief and disobedience in the desert. So he says, you today must not do that. You must encourage one another. That is, in persevering and continuing in the faith, in uh, pursuing obedience and repentance and so on. And so it's not talking about a gimmick or a, 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 a particular device or something like that. It's a pretty massive picture of encouraging one another to pursue the faith faithfully, to persevere in it all the way to the end. Is there another hand? Dr. Carson, I'm wondering if you could talk briefly about a cultural notion that the evangelical church is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. <laughs> that's not my line, that's somebody else. Yes, I know. Um, I could name him. Uh, uh, historically, it's not true. Um, to the extent that there is alignment today, it's sometimes been generated not because of particular loyalty to this particular form of the Republican Party, but just because of the widespread perception that Hillary represented a greater threat, especially with respect to the Supreme Court. And that was a widely enough uh, perceived threat that th th there was a lot of um, the alignment between those who cared about uh, tertiary education and homosexual marriage and this sort of thing, that uh, it, it produced a, a certain kind of loyalty along that line. Although what I would argue, what I would argue is that this current situation offers us a spectacularly good opportunity to distinguish between our preferred political party and the gospel. Um, do, do, do you see, in, in any election, in any year in America's history, a thoughtful Christian, deeply committed to the eternal kingdom of God, a thoughtful Christian, might prefer one party or another party, but at a certain level, in making that choice, would have to hold his or her nose. 
I'm old enough to have voted in a lot of parties, in a lot of elections, in England, where I lived for many years, in Canada and here. I'm a US citizen. And there has not been a time when I haven't had to hold my nose, no matter who I voted for. Because after all, there are very few people who, who, um, who are so b deeply biblical in their thinking that, 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 that they really represent a God's eye view. We heard a lot of godly wisdom this morning from Ben Sass, but I'm sure if I argued with him long enough, I'd find some place where I disagreed with him. No? And, and so what, what, one of the things that you want to say is yeah, get involved in politics and do, do, do your best because that's part of loving your neighbor as yourself and doing justice and loving mercy. That's fine. But don't make it absolute. That, that's one of the things we were hearing from Sass this morning. That's, that's really important. It's, 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 it, the, the kingdom of God transcends all that. Um, if the world goes on and Christ does not come back for a while, um, believe it or not, this kerfuffle is going to pass by. In a hundred years, if the world goes on, people will be reading it in the history books and wondering what all the fight was about. And, you know? And, and, and at the end of the day, what endures is the eternal kingdom. And we're heading for a new, the new heaven and the new earth. There is no utopia. It's utopia. There's no place. And if you get so involved in politics that your hope, your identity, your passion, your heart beat, turns on getting your politics right, um, then I pity you. Your vision is too small. W where is the church that rises up and say, yes, I will do good for Jesus' sake, but meanwhile, yes, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Anything less is too narrow a, a vision. So we have a lot of correction to do in our own circles, no doubt about it, no matter where you align yourself politically. Now, I'm told I'm supposed to... If, oh, we've, we've still got about uh, two minutes. One more question. I don't know who's got the mic. There it is. Uh, thank you for your ministry to us today. Uh, as you look at the literature and what's being written today, what, uh, what concerns do you have for the next five, ten years within the strands of evangelical discourse today? Where is the next debate, the next problem going to be? Yes, I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. <laughs> and I work for a non-profit organization. I stole that line from Walt Kaiser, but it's a great line. Um, I mean, I could make some intelligent guesses, but I claim no profound insight. And uh, I mean, how many people voted, uh, how many people expected uh, six weeks, six days before the election that it would turn out the way it did? So what right do I have here to stand up here and tell you what you need to be aware of uh, five years from now, you know? In broad sociological terms, I think I could point out some things. Um, but, but even, for example, the, the, the press for endless victimization, I'm more of a victim than you are. And the biggest offense being if I'm offended, which has the potential for killing free speech, which has the potential for imposing draconian laws down the road. All of that's only potential. Meanwhile, there are signs here and there of a kickback. There are signs of people beginning to turn the pendulum the other way. I don't know what's going to happen. You saw what happened. Tim Keller is supposed to be at, at, a, at a council meeting of TGC uh, tomorrow afternoon. He's not going to be there. The reason is because he's going off to Princeton Seminary to give, uh, to, to give a lecture. Oh, well, there's been a whole kerfuffle over that because the, the, there was enough opposition that, uh, that they were going to give him an award that uh, they want him to give the lecture but don't want him to get the, the award. Uh, he finds it a huge joke. Uh, he, he says, I really want to get there and talk to them. I don't care whether I get an award or not, you know. So he's coming out smelling like a rose, because, partly because there, there, there's been a huge backlash against Princeton for, for being so narrow-minded and, and bigoted. You know, if you really are tolerant, then why are you shutting up somebody who's just a little bit farther to the right than you are? So one of the most blistering pieces I've seen on the whole thing came not out of a Christian camp, but out of the Wall Street Journal. So life is complex, and you are beginning to see a, a, a pendulum swing. I don't know where any of that's going to end up. I, I have no idea. So I think that Christians have to be um, faithful, um, prophetic with respect to the evils of their own day, uh, repentant, humble, centered on the gospel all the time, and whether it turns out that it issues in persecution, 
even jail time or a bit of abuse. In that case, we'll take the stance of the apostles in Acts 5.41. Then the apostles rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. But on the other hand, God could raise up another Whitfield and Wesley and do it again. Uh, who, who knows? We live in interesting times. And to quote Billy Graham, may the Lord bless y'all real good.